Hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hancock, and I'm going to welcome you to the uh, Humanistic Management Professionals Lunch and Learn. This is a production of the USA chapter of the International Humanistic Management Association. I'm Jennifer Hancock. I am the immediate past president of the USA chapter and the founder of a company called Humanist Learning Systems. And my co-host is the wonderful Elizabeth Castillo, who is the current president of the USA chapter. Hello, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We are so happy to have you. Um, I'm Elizabeth Castillo at California State University, San Bernardino. Uh, welcome. All righty. And our guest today is Mr. Hart Nagpal. He's the Managing Director and CEO of Tata Play, which is India's largest content distribution platform since 2010. He has an engineering degree, which he followed with an MBA, which he completed in 1985. He has almost four decades of experience uh, working in packaged goods, services, cosmetics, cooking oil, retail beverages, and telecom industries before he joined Tata Play. And he, we are so thrilled to have him here. And I think you're going to like hearing from him. I've certainly enjoyed my conversations. He's going to talk about his CEO culture there at Tata Play, Collaborate, Experiment, and Own. Welcome, Harit. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, ladies and Jen. Uh, pleasure being here. Great. Well, just dive in and talk to us about how to collaborate, experiment, and own. <clears throat> So thank you very much for having me over. Uh, you know, you offered to uh, uh, allow me uh, with, with a PowerPoint presentation. And I said, look, this is lunchtime. People are going to be having one a phone in one hand, a pizza slice in another. How do you expect them to read and listen at the same time on the phone? So there's no PowerPoint. I'm only going to speak. And there's a little disclaimer in the beginning, which is that whatever I say are my views today. They were not my views yesterday. They may not be my views tomorrow. Everything we tried, we did not succeed at. So let me just be upfront about it. Our circumstances were ours. Yours may be different. So please treat whatever I say as a perspective and not necessarily your truth. Let's get down to the business that we're talking about, the state of the business today across the world. Uh, Businesses across the world are increasingly getting commoditized. And what do I mean when I say they're getting commoditized? It's like every business has equal access to raw materials, technology, capital. And in emerging markets like ours, like India, uh, where licenses and permissions took years in the past, these are either not required or are easily available. So even that's not a hindrance to start a business. And to stay competitive, a business must also match the prices of its lowest priced competitor and the reseller margins of the one with the highest margin. Hence, none of the traditional ingredients that helped differentiate a business in the past uh, works in today's age. And even if it does for a short while, it cannot be sustained. So any differentiator takes a few days to replicate just like a new business idea does. So we are in a completely commoditized world. People seem a business's only differentiator that can be sustained. And every business that I see is fighting to hire the brightest, the most passionate people and make them stay. Now, traditional organizations would keep and motivate people by offering them SOPs such as salaries, bonuses, fancy designations, uh, incentives, larger offices, amenities, I mean, you name it, these kinds of SOPs. Uh, however, we are increasingly seeing that people are happier when they believe that the organization's work culture provides them the freedom to operate and the ability to make a difference and hence grow professionally. Being looked after is not enough reason for people to stay, which is the organization's objective in the end. That people deliver their best and kind of make a difference is no longer just an organization's requirement, therefore. People themselves feel the strong need to make a difference and they'll stay only in an organization whose culture allows them to do that. So hence, if people are indeed a differentiator for a business, 
to make them a sustainable differentiator, people need to believe that they have the freedom to create the impact, else they leave, regardless of what you pay them or what you call them. Many organizations I know believe that organization is like a family and its culture should be what our parents taught us to do. I, I, I've often heard statements like, uh, we will not take what's not ours. We will be responsible corporate citizens. We'll contribute back to the society in which we do business, et cetera, et cetera, in response. When I ask them about what's your culture, what's your organization culture? Well, these to me are kind of core human values. They are the must-do things uh, that any good human being should do, any good corporate citizen must do. Hence, these cannot be compromised. These do not create a distinct organization culture because these neither facilitate nor encourage people to deliver their best. They're simply hygiene. They're must-dos. They're non-negotiable. So what then defines an organization's culture? That's the question we need to ask. An organization's culture in today's context, to me, is a set of enablers that help people willingly work together to create an impact and also to deliver the organization's business objectives. It is not the hygiene factors that I just spoke about. Hence, we need to start with what business are we in? What's our expected outcome? And what support do people that we work with need from the organization so that they can deliver the best outcomes? Now, in addition to the many headwinds that today's businesses are facing, there are two unique complexities that have been recently added to the mix. The first one is our circumstances have become very, very unpredictable. So it's very difficult to create a business continuity plan, which CFOs used to create in the past and say, hey, let's trigger this whenever the predicted disaster strikes. The problem is COVID has taught us that disasters are unpredictable, both with respect to their form, where they come from, and their scale. I mean, the word lockdown did not exist in our vocabulary till three years ago. Today, we all prepare for another lockdown, uh, whatever be the reason. Second, in the past, we made and consumed products that were mostly packaged goods. And I've, I've spent half my life in packaged goods and half my, half my life in services. So therefore, I can talk about it. Uh, these goods had a physical form. Most of what we consume today are experiences. These are virtually delivered. They are either services or even if they are products, they depend on other services for their delivery and consumption. So physical products of the past, which were the, which were the dominant industry in the past, could have been produced, delivered, consumed sequentially with one unique function, whether it is the procurement department, the the production department or the sales department, uh, you know, uh, working on a process at every stage while all other functions could be either sleeping on or, or were on a vacation. Experiential products of today require at least three to four functions of an organization to work simultaneously at every stage, be it the design, the production or delivery. So, in fact, every one of our products at Tata Play, where I work, is of an experiential nature and is delivered virtually. So hence, we probed for specific behaviors, which if displayed by our people, would help us deliver our business objectives. Now, this would not only provide a sense of achievement to our people and make them feel good about themselves, but it would also make our investors also happy. So it serves two purposes. And guess what we discovered? We discovered many things, but you know, there were three that stood on top. The first, humans inherently do not like to work in teams. That's a fact, believe it or not. Given a choice, you know, a footballer would like to dribble the ball from one end of the field to the other, score a goal, acknowledge to the cheers of the spectators, lift the trophy, go home. 
So therefore, we made rules for the game of football that do not allow one person to do everything. And as a result, both the players and the spectators enjoy when 11 players in each of the two teams collaborate for 90 minutes and one team wins. We, in, we inserted these rules. They didn't exist. Uh, some of us who've had a second child with a gap after the first would realize how difficult it is for the first child to accept the second in the house. We don't like to work with other people. We, we like to own the space that we have. Now, this applies to humans who deliver business results too. Hence, the first organization behavior we wanted to inculcate was collaboration. Hence, the need to encourage a collaborative culture. So that was the first piece. The second piece that we discovered after probing was that the canvas that most new industries are trying to paint is still completely white. Opportunities are available to us in infinite proportions. So the painter either has a safe choice of filling up the canvas with a little hut. You know, when we went to school and in the art class when we were young, they asked us to make a painting. 90 out of 100 kids would have painted a little hut with a tree by its side, a long pathway leading to the hut, a sunset in the background and two birds flying back home. I mean, that's the painting I remember I made and almost everyone in my class made when we were kids. If a business does that today, no one will buy that painting. Today's painter has to experiment with new ideas like maybe chuck a small can of paint diagonally across the canvas, followed by another paint chucked across the canvas. Chances are he'll have a masterpiece. Chances also are that the canvas will be ruined. For an opportunity loss of a canvas, you have the possibility of creating a masterpiece. This won't happen unless the painter is willing to experiment and is willing to waste a canvas in the quest for kind of creating a masterpiece. So people don't experiment normally because of the fear of failure. So if the fear of failure is taken away from above their heads, people will dare to experiment. So allow them, I would say rather encourage them to make mistakes as long as they make a different mistake every time. I'd say reward unique failures. Do not reward those who chose the straight and narrow and deliver what was expected. So therefore, the next organization behavior we picked for ourselves was experimentation. So after collaboration, the second that came in was experimentation for these reasons that I just stated. Now, when people collaborate on tasks, uh, they are actually experimenting with the unknown and they're working in teams. Imagine you're going on a driving vacation with your friends and you just set out on the journey. Even if there are four of you in the car, there is always one person who has the control of the steering the accelerator and the brakes. The others are allowed to like, you know, do some backseat driving. They can debate on where to stop for a snack or a do, uh, whether to take the longer scenic route or the shortcut. But the steering must be held in one pair of hands. Imagine if all four had their hands on the steering and their feet on the brakes. Just imagine that state. And that's what happens in most organizations I've seen. Hence, we picked ownership as the next organization behavior to promote. One person may, must take ownership of a task, even if many are working on it. So the three alphabets of the chosen organization behavior that we you know, zoomed in on were collaborate, experiment, own. And once we wrote this down and somebody said, hey, this is CEO. So this was about 12, 13 years ago. And we've been promoting the CEO culture within Tata Play for over 12 years now. Everybody's designated a CEO. People have mugs which say uh, the person's name and CEO underneath. There are cushions sitting behind people's uh, chairs which say the CEO sits here, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we discovered CEO, but I, I can say you need not do that. You know, you can analyze your own businesses, opportunities, the threats that you have, figure out what are the three, four behaviors that will help people deliver its objectives and make your own acronym for the work culture that will enable them. In fact, I have a friend 
who recently took over as a CEO of another organization. And she was like fumbling as to how do I build a culture? And I told her my story and she, she probed and she identified collaboration, transparency, and agility. And we said, hey, hang on, let's turn this around. It's not collaboration, agility, and transparency. It's collaboration, transparency, agility, and transparency, not tra transparency and agility. And that makes for CAT. C-A-T, CAT. So, so her organization, everybody is today known as CATs. They're all CATs. So they're promoting the CAT culture out there. So in our case, having identified, collaborate, experiment, and known, everyone, as I said, was designated CEO. We had an all-hands meeting, this is about 12 years ago, to announce these chosen behaviors with much fanfare. And we were all very happy. There was beer flowing around and there were pizzas and everything like happens in most organizations when these meetings happen. We were also aware that these initiatives usually have a very short lifespan. And to extend that, we began to look for enablers that could help sustain the CEO culture that we just recently discovered. So one of the enablers we chose was to ask people to identify a colleague who displayed a C or an E or an O behavior and post it on the internet with the incident. Entries that were received are evaluated by a cross-functional team the best 2025 initiative is selected every quarter. Their reward, or you can call it a punishment, is that these 2025 people get to spend a day with me in a room with no one else around. So I thought it was a punishment. They, they felt it was a reward. We chat. We chat about what they did that got them into this room while their peers did not make it. There are learnings in these conversations for everyone in the room including myself. And since these are frontline employees from across the country, I get to know what's happening in the trenches on the war front. Attendees to get to, they, they get to hear about, you know, the firsthand narrative of Tata Play's long-term objectives, our priorities, what we stand for, what we don't stand for, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We used to go back and play back to their colleagues back home, wherever they come from. So it helps me, you know, permeate the culture continuously, consistently, all the time through different bunch of people. We've been doing this for about 12 years now, including during the lockdown. Those days we would do it online. We're back to doing it in a room again. We haven't missed a single quarter in the last 12, 12 and a half years or whatever it is. Uh, what else is supporting the CEO culture? Our business reviews are not functional reviews. They joined up reviews with every function present. So if we, if we identify an action point at a review, Every function has a say in the decision, as well as they own the responsibility to deliver it in a manner it was envisaged when it was conceived. Our workplace is an open space. There are a lot of open spaces I see with no designated seats. Everyone, including me, sits in the open. We sit with someone we are collaborating with for the task, not someone who's from our function or someone we like. People often sit with three different sets of people during a day's work in three different places. Uh, we also supported CEO by stopping to mark attendance and allowing people to work from a place of their choice. And this is even after COVID was over. And most office staff, including me, come to work only two or three times a day. We don't go to work five times a day, a, a week. Uh, we go to work when we need to do that. Uh, we, we go to work when we need to do some whiteboard thinking with other team members. And working from home during COVID made us realize that reviews are more efficient when held online. So there are review days and there are whiteboard thinking days. And whiteboard thinking days are in the office. Review days are at workplace, uh, at home. Most of work, our work is delivered by project teams, which we form multiple project teams. At, and these are cross-functional project teams. You may be an owner in one team while being a participant in another. Owners are chosen regardless of their level in the organization. So, you know, I could be reporting to somebody. The team I'm working in could be like five levels below me uh, as an owner. We trust our people, create clear objectives and reward them for the delivery. They do not need to be in our line of sight for us to believe that they're actually working. 
and the organization is very lean anyone not overtly displaying these behaviors gets exposed and stands the risk of kind of you know in medical terms they say organ rejection by the others so our frontliners are completely empowered they don't have to check back before taking a routine call so a lean and empowered organization when faced with a small or a large disaster like covid happened or there's a flooding in some remote location or a tech failure or a regulatory intervention which is like disabling for the business as such uh, happens a bunch of people huddle together find the cause find the way out and you know they are already in an implementation mode often times before bothering to inform the leadership team leave alone seek their permission so that's how empowered they are a lean organization with few levels forces us to promote people only when they are ready to value add to the job they are doing and are ready to become managers to the role they are currently performing themselves every time someone leaves us our first option is to look for someone who can shoulder that role in addition to their current responsibility so only when we don't find someone suitable do we look outside almost everyone's job is growing with time i myself you know i used to have some 3 years ago i had 13 direct reportees i have 6 now these 6 are actually holding 13 responsibilities which were held by 13 people in the last 3 years ago as such so if you believe that people need to be given new bigger designations often enough to keep them motivated you may think of this as a limiting factor it actually becomes an enabler if you believe that people constantly need to have an opportunity to do more and you want to send them home smiling every day instead of once in a year or two when they get a promotion the last thing that we are currently experimenting with and i'm like struggling with this with my people is we changing people's goals to inputs instead of outputs for instance sales people are usually rewarded for the sales they bring in however you know after they've created a customer and succeeded in re- retaining that customer they have little control on how competitive our product is how effective our advertising is how well the economy is doing is there a tech disruption or not a salesman doesn't have that control on these things hence they should not be re- rewarded for create they should actually be rewarded for creating customers and retaining them not what sales they bring in and this applies to other functions too that's that's my belief i'm struggling with people the people who are going to be positively impacted by this themselves don't believe because of the conditioning of the past that you know this can be actually better for them but yeah i guess we shall so these are the some some of the initiatives we've taken in this direction and now like i'm kind of open to questions if there are any well thank you so much harit i'm sure uh we're going to have a lot of questions i can already see some of them showing up in the chat room if you do have a question for mr nagpal please put it in the chat i want to kind of follow up with a couple of questions that just kind of um kind of came up as you're talking about like the ownership and you did mention this it requires a lot of trust and i think this ties into the last thing you said about you're experimenting with changing the metrics by which the employees are uh held to from you know say a salesperson how many sales did you make versus how many customers did you make happy right um and people are struggling with that i was wondering if you can talk a little bit more about how you facilitate you obviously done this change 12 years ago and you're still experimenting so when you roll these things out and you meet with some pushback how do you handle that i so so it, it it's not something that you can achieve in a day you need to be persistent you need to be consistent you need to take people's views you need to answer back you need to have a debate you need to have an organizational debate every time you make a change it can't be like top down saying this is the way we're going to be working from tomorrow it always works when you have a debate so this is a thought that i've been struggling with for the last 4 months and i've not given up and i use every forum to talk about it and i gather views and i mold them and i soften them and i soften them people say hey we can't trust people and my my response to that is nobody wakes up in the morning and says hey i'm going to go to work at 9 o'clock and screw the place up nobody wakes up saying everybody wakes up with a good intention everybody lands at the office with a good intention 
you need to facilitate that intention to turn into uh, that's the starting point that's the belief that we start with okay. we've had too many years of mistrust where we say hey he works only when he's in the office he works only when there is a supervisor on top of him he works only when he's given a direction and in the evening some 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 uh, some kind of review is held as to what did you do today and what are you going to do tomorrow leave the guys alone it works yeah so i guess my next question and i'm pretty sure most people have this because we've all worked in organizations where uh, people don't pull their weight or worse they're you know toxic and sabotaging the work of others um and so can you talk a little bit about your experience with the culture you created at Tata Play and how it kind of, does it shut down that toxic behavior? <laughs> no, it doesn't. In fact, you know, I'd say that maneuvering an organization is like losing weight or staying healthy. You've got to do it every day. And even if you reach your targeted level, uh, it takes a lot of effort to maintain it at that level. And especially when there is 20, 25% attrition in organizations, the new people joining in, there are new circumstances, there are tensions every day, there's external circumstances that are creating acrimony within the organization, et cetera, et cetera. It's not easy to maintain balance or re remove toxicity out of an organization. But yeah, you can make your attempts. For example, if somebody comes up to me and uh, backbites about somebody else, say, I say, hey, 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 that's what, and that happens very often in our organization where somebody comes up and says, do you know he's, he said this to me about you, et cetera, et cetera. And what do you do? You either listen to him, you say, I'll, I'll, I'll see to him, whatever it is, or you pick up the phone in his presence and call up that person in his presence. That's the operative word. And say, this is what I heard you said about me or you said about this task, or you said about the outcome, or your disbelief in the outcome. And the word spreads in a couple of days that, hey, there's no point going and sneaking to him about these things. Transparency works so beautifully in removing toxicity. Perfect. So... One of the last question I want to ask before we open up, because I can see the chat is starting to blow up with questions, is for people, a lot of the questions we got had to do with people who are in organizations right now who are struggling <laughs> with a bad culture. Um, and there's a variety of different sorts of questions, but the one that stuck, stuck out to me is um, when, if someone isn't fitting in, they're not collaborating, they're not experimenting, they're not owning, um, when did you do you decide to fire them? How does that work? Um, you know, you obviously want to trust people, right? But at some point, if it's not there, what do you do? Do you fire them? What do you do? So, so very strange that this question was asked to me by somebody just three days ago, and I've actually posted this on the answer to this on LinkedIn. So I'll just repeat what I said that uh, it was. There are three reasons. You need to first figure out as to why is the person not fitting in and why you're wanting to fire them. And the first is really, is it a skill gap? And if it's a skill gap, then you need to fix that skill gap, help him fix that skill gap. And even at the end of that, if you come to a conclusion that, hey, he's reached his glass ceiling, he can't go above this. This is the end. You need to have a conversation with the person and come to a negotiated settlement, which says, hey, you're not going to grow beyond this. In fact, I may have to retain you at this level or one level below two. And have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation there. There's no, no, no harm in that. And come to a settlement there. So that's the skill piece. If it's integrity that is causing you to ask him to leave, take a Take, take an hour max. Don't take more than an hour, but provided you have documentary evidence. A lot of time we create integrity issues without any documentary evidence. In the absence of documentary evidence, please don't even go there. Oh. And the biggest one is what we call attitude of behavior. These are the difficult ones. These are wrong hires. And you are yourself responsible for it. You hired him. So you got to take on the responsibility. 
have a heart to heart if you think you can change his mind please do that if you can't give him a long rope to find a place which suits the person's you know behavior which accepts that behavior but in the meantime hire an alternative don't wait for this person to leave to hire the alternative so integrity skill attitude or behavior first define why are you wanting to get rid of him then take the course well thank you so much for that i think that's actually a really helpful um philosophic approach to dealing with employees that are perceived to be problems um and may not be or maybe elizabeth um i'm seeing we have questions in the chat do you want to ask some of them on behalf of people a lot of questions i sure do um and yeah uh, how do you i would say i really appreciate that you know your thing about taking responsibility for hiring people i think so often the blame game gets played and, and the problem is all put onto the problematic employee rather than uh, the other issues um, so I'll start with Jacob Eisenberg. Um, he wanted to, uh, he was just pointing out how well what you're saying matches with some of the things that he's teaching in his courses. Um, so thank you for that comment, Jacob. Um, Jacob. And then um, Dr. Suni Young asked about um, psychological safety. And uh, would you be open to discussing this concept further, uh, particularly in the context of your leadership philosophy and day-to-day -day interactions, uh, your behaviors and attitudes toward fa share, failure and sharing your mistakes? Yeah, sure. We've made mistakes. Like I said, everything that we did did not succeed. We've tried various things. I, I mean, offhand, I can't recall a few of them, but... The, Half the stuff that we do doesn't succeed, but at least we try. Because if the culture of the organization is about experimenting, uh, if the mistakes, unique mistakes are always pardoned. In fact, we laugh over them. I'm glad we tried it. At least it's not stuck in my head that, uh, you know, I wish I had done it. We try it at smaller scale. It doesn't succeed. We dump it. It's. Uh, I remember... Uh, so this is not related to organization, but, you know, I kept saying that we should advertise this way and we should use the front page, et cetera, et cetera, and make an offer to customers. So the guy said, okay, let's pander to his needs and let's do it. So we took the front page of the National Daily and we spent a couple of million dollars on that one page ad, which went to millions of people in that day. We got a total of 14 calls by the end of the day. At least... They got me off their back after that. Can I? So we are open to admitting. Yeah. yeah. Can I ask a follow up question? Because we did get a question related to this in the pre questions. And that is someone wanted to know what the most expensive experiment failure <laughs> was. We've launched three products. We got into three new businesses. We got into five new businesses. Two of them are working. Three of them are not working. They were businesses. We hired people for them. We experimented with them. We hired equipment for them. We set up platforms for them. And then we ran them for about six months. And then at the end of that, when we made the projections, we said it won't buy us lunch five years from now. And yeah, the moment we took that call, there were 25. I remember one of those cases in the afternoon at about 12 o'clock in the office, we realized we did the math and we said, hey, it's been running in six months. Let's shut this off. So the 25 people working on it, we called them into the boardroom. And we said, I've taken the call. I've taken the call to start it. After six months, I am taking the call to shut it down. But let me assure you, not one of them, one of you is losing your job because it wasn't your mistake. We will find you a role in the rest of the organization and be shutting it. I said, no, boss, give it about another two months, three months. Maybe it turns around. I said, no, I can't see this turning around. Let's stop wasting time, effort, and money behind this. This is not our cup of tea. This is not our business. Let's shut it down. Let's admit our mistake. Let's move on. And we've done that thrice to three different lines of businesses. So have the courage to say it's not working. But don't penalize people who are working on that because it wasn't their mistake. You posted them there. Thank you so much. Um, 
uh, do you have a way to systematize your learning process? Um, like, do you capture the learnings and share them uh, throughout the organization? So yeah, uh, one 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 aspect I did not mention while I was talking about how we've been promoting this uh, transparent and open culture as such. Uh, around uh, April of every March of every year, uh, we take our business, create a business plan for the next rolling for the next five years and firm for the next one year and take it to the board and present it over a day to them and take their approval for the business plan as such. So that's the strategy. What's what's the change? How did we perform in the past? What worked? What did not work? And what are we planning for the next one year? And uh, it's been a habit that uh, we actually take that plan in a truncated manner, obviously not a day's thing, but an hour's presentation to all hands. People said, why are you taking it to the frontliners? And uh, we've said, no. The guys need to know beyond their basic today's job or day-to-day -day job about what's it delivering for the company. And uh, we've been doing that for years now. Uh, and, and, and people said that people could take pictures of those slides and send it to the competition. And it's landed up with the comp competitors. Well, if we can't make hair or tail of it, uh, let the competition get confused for some time. So, so, so it works. I mean, it, 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 it's this transparency has worked for us. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing so that. In, in that. In that, in that, in that process, whatever mistakes we made in the last year and whatever have been the results of those are shared with everybody. And whatever mistakes we are going to make for the next year are also shared with everybody. <laughs> yeah, I think what's coming through for me about that, uh, your your story is just, you know, not letting fear drive the train, but really the sense of caring and, and uh, trying things, openness. Um, Robbie Chitna, uh, who's with us, um, said he's, I like the cute CEO acronym. Um, what about the resources for experimentation? They become scarcer as one goes down the hierarchical level. Um, how does one allocate resources for experimentation at lower levels in the organization? I do think there are hierarchical uh, experiments. I mean, experiments are organization-wide experiments. It's not that, so, and everybody's allowed to experiment at every level. If I make a mistake, it's $5 million. If somebody else at the lowest end makes a mistake, it's like a couple of hundred dollars. And everybody is allowed to do that. And if it's an organization-wide uh, experiment, it could be $1 million, it could be $20 million. And we've had both. And, and both have failed. So, but unless, so, so one caution we take is, if you've got a crazy idea, a new idea, something that's been untested in the past, test it out in a small geography, in a small segment of customers, etc. And if it works there, then take it to the country. Uh, don't like, you know, pet the bank or the kitchen uh, on a new idea as such. So is there a, an approval process for this sort of experimentation? I, I assume like a customer service representative working with someone, their experiments are going to be maybe immediate versus something that would require approval. Can it's you quick. talk about that? It's on the phone. It's on the phone. Okay. It, it's, it's, it's not a note that somebody has to prepare, then five people have to debate on it uh, over five weeks and then sign off on it. Very often, there is an experimentative culture we've created where somebody tells me on the phone or tells his boss on the phone and he says, hey, I think we need to test this out. The guy says, okay, test it out with this bunch of customers this way and that bunch of customers that way and give me the results. And that happens every day. So there's, 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 somebody has a new idea. This is how we're handling this process. If we handle it this way, it'll be better. Fine. We're handling it this way. Check out this particular state or this particular region or this particular segment of customers with this call center. Let's uh, offer them this instead of that. And let's see the results by the evening. It's easy. With a large customer base, it's easy to experiment these things. By the evening, the results are clear. It doesn't go through paperwork, bureaucracy, signing off, leadership team meeting, wait for the next XCOM meeting or whatever. No. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, 
Kathleen Curran, who's with us to do, uh, also uh, uh, resonates with this. Um, and uh, sometimes she wants to know about middle management being a barrier. She calls them the clay level, where lower level ideas sometimes get held up by middle management. Um, how do you uh, keep middle managers from becoming a barrier? Lean structure, lean structure, lean structure. Don't have too many people. And also uh, empower the front line. So what happens is I'm sitting in finance. I have an idea which has to be implemented by customer operations, maybe. So the traditional way of doing that is the guy at the front line in finance takes the idea all the way up in his organization. Then the boss at finance speaks to the boss at customer operations. It goes all the way down. Then it goes all the way up and then back again. And that's a long process. That's what you mean by middle management. You encourage the front end of the customer operations to speak to the front end of finance. And between them, they say, okay, let's test it out. And like I said, before we get to know about it, things are already being tested in the market. At a small scale, in a small way. And uh, if the results are good, fine. If it, it's not, they will themselves shut it down. Uh, so one of the things I heard in that answer then is that there is cross-departmental collaboration. I mean, it's so at many every organizations. Level. In at so every many level. Mm-hmm. Every level. Um, in organi- so many organizations, you know, you're not allowed to talk to somebody in another department unless you go through your boss and then they go to that boss and it goes down. So you don't have that those barriers. Like I, like I said, the office atmosphere, also, the office is structured like that. You don't have a fixed space. In most places, there's a marketing department, an HR department, a finance department, a customer ops department, an IT department, and they sit like in huddles of their own. Here are people sit down in project groups every day, three times a day, they're changing seats. So your structure of how you work, your workplace also is designed for that. That is so fascinating. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, so New Grover wants to know about artificial intelligence impact on um, organizational culture and how organizations should prepare for it. So again, I ask this very often saying, oh, will we be redundant? Will humans perish? Will computers take over? Will robots run our lives? I mean, every day I get asked these questions. Uh, you know, when I started working about four decades ago, we didn't even have desktops. If some of us had calculators. We didn't have couriers. We didn't have email. We didn't have an IT department. 1985 when I started working. And with every new disruption that came in, these words that are being talked about, about artificial intelligence, were being said about email and computers and laptops and desktops and everything. And what have we realized over the last 40 years? that each one of them actually took the ops out of our life and gave us time to think about the plan, the strategy. So the doing became easier, faster. So we could, we had more time to plan, more time to think, more time to strategize. And we could do, much, and, and the machines could do much more for us. And that's exact. this is a disruption of a scale we've not seen before. And it can actually help us take so much work off our tables. That was routine, repetitive, useless work that we were doing. And leave so much room for us to plan even bigger things. So whether it is culture or whether it is, uh, you know, uh, the time that we spend, it actually can give you so much more work-life balance, if you ask me. So rather than seeing it as a threat, seeing it as an opportunity, what it's opening Huge. up for new possibilities. Huge of the kind that we've not seen before. Uh, thank you for that. Um, Jacob Eisenberg is asking, um, uh, what, what critical elements would you recommend, including as part of a graduate business student's education to help them arrive to a better state of their organizations? You know, my constant peeve with the schools has been that they're very classroom oriented. Uh, There's very little interaction with the industry and the students. And I think industry is responsible for that too, because if the schools are creating fodder for you, raw material for you to utilize over the years, we have a responsibility to actually uh, 
you know, create interactive platforms with the students so that they get to see how business is really run. Very often, you know, you get students from graduate trainees or whatever from uh, schools and you have to retrain them because what they've been taught there is very different from how business operates. So I would say more uh, interaction between the industry and the schools. And I think industry needs to take up ownership of that. Okay, thank you for that. That's a, a great um, suggestion. Um, Jyoti uh, says, very interesting talk with great examples. Um, what can be applied, or creating culture is a long-term job. What can be applied from this to a culture in a smaller team that is not working well, if anything? Exactly the same. So the moment you turn culture's direction into uh, it's solving the business objective or contributing to the business objective. So it's not just small. It's also many people ask, hey, it's good in large multinational organizations that it works. It doesn't work in an owner-driven organization or an MSME or these kind of organizations. I say no, because in fact, it should work better in smaller organizations because the owner is sitting out there. He is so interested in today's profits. Uh, a large organization could probably have a site which goes into two years, three years, five years, and 10 years ahead. An owner manager, a small organization is looking at business outcomes like every day. And if the culture is kind of supporting business outcomes, instead of we will not take what is not ours and things like that, and we'll be nice to people and stuff like that. If the culture has elements which are supporting the business outcomes, you will actually get the owner manager uh, or a small organization even more interested. That's my belief. Um, thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, Luis Gerardo Gonzalez Lopez asked, um, "What in what are your recommendations to uh, to transform an organizational culture to a more humanistic perspective?" Can it be more humanistic? Like I just said before, that. Human beings don't wake up in the morning to say, I'm going to screw up this place. They wake up and say, how can I make a difference? How can I impact this place? How can I leave a mark? Will this place give me an opportunity to make, make a mark? And if the, if the culture is actually about enabling people to make that mark, that's what we're looking for. I'm wondering how that goes with, you know, the typical business ethos was about efficiency and productivity and, you know, the things that are um, really lead to anti-humanism or inhuman, inhumane behaviors. So, so which is why words like collaboration, words like experimentation, words, words like ownership, words, words like agility, words like transparency, find your words, which are which humans like to do, which are linked to human behavior, not the outcome, but the input. Because, see, when you're looking for happiness, you can't chase happiness. you got to find out what gives you happiness and then chase those factors. When you're looking for money, you can't chase money. you got to figure out what will help you make money and then chase those objectives and then you will make money. You can't run after money. Similarly, when you're looking for efficiency, you're looking for outcome, you're looking for profits, you're looking for EBITDA, you're looking for PAT, then you say, okay, what gives you that? And then chase those objectives. And if human beings are the differentiator here, then work on what will make these humans deliver what delivers the EBITDA. I really love that, uh, you know, looking at the inputs is really the things that you should be measuring. Um, that's such a, a transition from how business is usually taught. Um, do you use any kind of social accounting metrics or KPIs, uh, you know, that capture these kind of things? How do you do reporting to stakeholders uh, around these kind of things? Well, there, is, there are the usual uh, employee satisfaction indices that you have on various efforts. But something I can informally say, I don't have a measure for that really, but something I can informally say, if people have left us, they've left for left us for 2x or 3x salary. 
uh, were not for a bad boss. I haven't, I, I haven't, I don't know of many people who've left us because they had a bad boss or they were treated badly. That's amazing because one of the common things is, you know, people don't leave jobs, they leave bad bosses. Okay. <laughs> so, um, what a kudos, kudos to your organization. Um, Dr. Sunny Jong asks, um, how do you handle the recognition and crediting of individuals within the organization when collaboration is a central force and team uh, success is highly valued? So you've got something called, so first of all, feedback is instantaneous and not does not have to wait for the end of the year for an appraisal or something like that. We are appraised every day. Everybody is appraised every day, literally on the job uh, with what they're doing. So it's constant uh, concurrent feedback that goes to people. It's not like end of the year review. He's told that in March you did this very nice or in April you did that very bad. Uh, you told how you're performing all along. That's one. Uh, we have also constantly created another thing I did not talk about is we call them CEO projects, which is like, you know, there's a chain. We actually ask people, is there something around you which you think should not have been happening the way it is. So articulate that. Once you articulate that, okay, that becomes a project. Now find cross-functional team members who uh, could help you in delivering the change. And those projects are created. Uh, at any given point in time, there are about 40 to 50 such projects that are continuously rising. Some of these projects take three months, some take six months, some go on for a year. And uh, me and my direct reports are actually spending about an hour a week or something like that in reviewing about eight, 10 of these at any given point in time. So every project gets about once a month, one pager review as such. And then the, the, the most impacting projects out of these are celebrated annually, not only with public recognition, but with money too. Money is secondary, but public recognition is the big one. So somebody has identified a problem. This is not a part of his gold sheet or his, uh, you know, remit or whatever. Uh, he's just identified himself. He's gone and checked out a bunch of his colleagues who were willing to work with him. They worked on it in after hours on these projects. They made the difference. They're very happy. And then it becomes part of the process. And there are about 40 of these running concurrently. They've, they've been running for the last four years or so, four or five, four years now. Yeah. Very cool. Well, Just real quick, we've got about five minutes left. So I think if we take one more question um, and then we'll ask uh, Harit to have a final thought. Okay, uh, well, I'll go with Sonali Kel Kelkar's um, question. Um, uh, that, can you please share your perspective on how to shift the mindset, especially at middle management from the stick fear that it's needed to ensure a team delivers to uh, leave them alone and they will perform? So, like I said, it's about having a lean structure, having everybody exposed to everybody. And if somebody does not behave as per the culture that you set out for the organization, uh, he's identified very quickly, singled out, and the organ reject there's organ rejection. So in large organizations, these fat middle survive. In in lean organizations, there's no fat. And there's no middle. And everybody's actions are known to everybody. If somebody something is coming in the way, you can identify in a minute. If something is not behaving the way the machine should operate, it gets identified in a minute. And the final thought, if you ask me, is really that, yes, it starts at the top. That's the truth. But if it does start at the top, you can't, the bottom can't give up asking for it and should not. Because these are truths that if repeated multiple times, you know, register, the ring. And if you're, if the people above you, and oftentimes they say, hey, it's good to see because, you know, if the CEO is pushing it, then everything gets pushed. But if, you know, well, how can we push it because our CEO or the owner of the organization or uh, whoever it is at the top is like of a different mindset. Nobody's come here to waste money. 
nobody is come here to throw his investment away everybody wants the investment to turn around because in the end it's a business and if people at the bottom are giving constant feedback it's easy to chuck the job away and move on but where is the guarantee that the next place is going to be worse or better than this how about trying changing this murmurs work so it's not necessarily that the guy at the top is going to teach everybody people at the bottom can also teach people upstairs it works both ways thank you harit i've got two quick follow up questions and then we're going to ask you for your final thoughts the first one is when you started this initiative 12 years ago how long do you think it took before you you felt that the company and the employees got it so we were in a bad place in terms of the business was running and we didn't have a choice to so here was this fellow who walked in from outside and he said hey i think these are the three issues and uh, and and because i was talking uh, you know something that people could do together these were not things that were painful to collaborate is not painful to not be punished for mistakes is not painful to have an owner for a project is not a painful process it's it's not a punishment these were fresh thoughts so i did get a huge amount of acceptance i must say so if you come in with a fresh i did not say that hey we got this much gpt da we need to change it to this much i did not say our turnover is so much we need to take it to so much i did not say our share is so much we need to take it to so much we said hey let's look at the input variables and everybody was collaborating everybody was happy with that so my final thought if you ask me really if you were to ask me that is come out with things that people can do and willingly do not come out with what your expectation of the outcome is if you focus on the inputs that people can provide to deliver your outputs and you identify those inputs rightly for your business in your situation from where where you are in the industry people will willingly co 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 cooperate they did in my case everyone did and it's sustained for 12 years now awesome i think the last question i have and hopefully we can do this quickly if not we'll run just a little bit over um is tata play is obviously part of tata right um and it's a rather large company and i was curious about how your bosses um in the larger conglomerate that is tata felt about obviously they hired you um but how did you navigate their expectations versus what you hope to do for tata play i think uh, what we did here at tata play pretty much resonated with the culture overall culture of the group it wasn't at crossroads with them it was completely in line with the ethos of the group uh, which is it resonated completely so therefore i did not face any objections in fact it was celebrated so final thoughts what do you want to leave us with give it a shot assess assess where you are whether you are an msme small business and owner run business or a part of a very large global conglomerate figure out where you are in the industry that you are part of see what are the opportunities and don't go for outcomes look at your people they are your only differentiators raw material packing material uh, machinery technology uh, you know market opportunities economy government regulation are not your opportunities your people are your opportunities see how they can work differently to deliver a better outcome focus on the inputs that your people can provide rest will follow awesome thank you so much um i want to thank everyone who participated in the session today harit we are so thrilled you agreed to join us it's been very enlightening i think our audience at um the humanistic management association is going to be really happy to see this For those of you who are on the call or watching this online, if you enjoyed the program, we hope you'll consider joining our community 
and become a member so that you can support the work that we do when we do these things. Uh, we are also always looking for volunteers, people to serve on boards, committees. Even if you're not in the USA, we're an international association and we can point you in the right direction. Uh, so if you want to get more involved, please let us know. Um, members do, in addition to supporting the association, do get to enjoy the ability to network with other like-minded individuals, both professionals and academics, and they can post their work at our, our website and our membership site. So thank you again for your support. We will be back in November. Thanks so much. Thank you.